chapter 20. You're going to see in this 20th chapter, Satan, who knows that Christ is coming through the seed of that woman, meaning Eve, umbilical cord to umbilical cord. It would seem that Sarah has been singled out at this time, though she's pushing about 90 years old here now, coming close to it, probably 89. Satan knows that God has made the covenant, the promise, so he's on her case, and he's on Abraham's case, and everything he can do to prevent that seed coming through as he tried to destroy her in the sixth chapter of this book of Genesis with the fallen angels. So he makes another try here. God intervenes. Let's get to it. Chapter 20, verse 1, a word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua's name. Verse 1, chapter 20, and it reads, And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country and dwelled between Kadesh and Shur and sojourned in Gira. Uh, Gira simply means in the Hebrew tongue a lodging place. But Kadesh, as I explained once earlier, it's kind of a special word. It means holy well enough. But also, it can mean holy in the sense of evilly holy, like to bad spirits or the um, um, practice in which the sodomites would practice, one that is dedicated to that. It's even um, a form of temple male prostitution. Uh, Kadesh. Interesting word. What? But it can mean holy in a good sense as well. And of course, Shur means a wall and just simply a rock wall. Verse 2. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gia, sent and took Sarah. Now here she is, 89 years old, and must have been a very beautiful woman. It would seem that Abraham had this one weakness. Naturally, had she been his wife with her beauty, had it been reported she was his wife, that is, but had it been reported, they most likely would have killed him. Now, though Abraham had faith in God, unquestionable, it would seem there were times that he didn't have faith in people, all right? Maybe that's well earned. Verse 3. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man. For the woman whom thou hast taken, has taken rather, for she is a man's wife. She's married to a man already. Now, here we see uh, what, what God is saying is restore her or be killed. Pretty direct and very blunt. And I'm sure there were some happenings already beginning to take place among his people of the entire nation. Verse 4. And Abimelech had not come near her. And he said, Lord, interesting that in the older uh, uh, text, the word here is Yahweh. So for Abimelech to know the sacred name is um, documents that he knew who he was talking to. Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? You got, you're going to kill our whole nation? And we are right. I mean, he, did, he was a good man. He tried to do what was right. And verse 5, speaking of Abraham, Abimelech states, Said he not unto me, she is my sister? And she, even she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart, maybe better translated sincerely from the bottom of my heart, and in innocency of my hands have I done this. In other words, he's saying that they lied to me if this is the case. For I'm innocent in this. Verse 6, And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore, 
suffered I thee not to touch her. In other words, God uh, would state that God himself had intervened and caused this man Abimelech not to touch her. Touch, again, is that word that we found and I broke back to the Hebrew for you when Eve was told not to partake or touch the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Hebrew word is naga and one of the meanings is to lie with a woman. And this documents coming from the mouth of God himself that this was the strength and the subject matter in which it was utilized. So, um, interesting, you bet. It's a second witness to the events of Genesis chapter 3. With God's intercession, God had made a covenant and God interceded because it would be the Christ child that would come through this lineage. Verse 7. Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet, Abraham prophet, how about that? And he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, if you don't do it, know thou that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. Your entire nation I'll wipe out. Abimelech didn't know it, perhaps in full. He was getting a pretty good idea, but it had already happened because God had dried up the womb of every, uh, of every uh, person and animal in the kingdom of Abimelech. Verse 8. Therefore Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all his servants. He wasn't wasting any time. This was serious and told all these things in their ears and the men were sore afraid they knew of a fact it is good perhaps that you take note that even though this is a a heathen nation so to speak that their morals were above board certainly they wanted to do what was right verse 9 then Abimelech called Abraham and said unto him, What hast thou done unto us? Question. And what have I offended thee that thou hast brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? In other words, uh, don't read over that. Abimelech knew it was a sin to take another man's wife. Thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. You have not done right by me. Uh, it's too bad that every heathen nation that Israel would come up against did not have the morals or the character to accomplish, not only to know, but to accomplish and do that that was right. Verse 10. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? In other words, what was in your eye, which is the eye of your mind in a sense, it means what were you thinking? What were you trying to prove? What did you have in your mind that you would do such a thing? Verse 11. And Abraham said, Because I thought Surely the fear of God is not in this place. So number one, he was wrong there because it was. And they will slay me for my wife's sake. And Abraham shows fear here. Uh, the, and the enemy, Satan, worked on that fear. It's amazing. And I suppose... Uh, I want, in a sense, for you to take strength from Abraham's fear for the simple fact that Abraham, being Abram, one chosen by God, renamed by God to the name Abraham, father of many nations, that within this one there was fear also. So never be ashamed of yourself if fear should come in you. It is, it's basically a natural the weakness of man and it is a weakness though that learn from this that Satan will take advantage of 
So uh, the reason I say that, I want you to hone your faith and strengthen your faith. You see, man didn't have really all that much other than really to fall short. That's to say, he didn't really the same as lie to the man, and you'll find out in a minute. But he didn't exactly tell him the whole truth either. So uh, I'm saying, even though you have fear at times, don't let that uh, seem to you as though you're a total failure. Everyone practices fear or they have something missing somewhere. I suppose fear is uh, not to be ashamed of. It's what you do while you are under that fear that counts. Many brave men with fear accomplish great things. Verse 12. And yet indeed she is, she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. In other words, they were half brother and half sister. I <laughs> know, let me rephrase that. Uh, Sarah was Abraham's half sister, and, Abra and um, uh, Sarah being Abraham's half sister, whereas Abraham was Sarah's half brother. And um, so she was, in a sense, his sister, but at the same time, she was his wife. It was not uncommon from the time of Adam and Eve that there were close marriages. The law of incest had not come forth at this time. It would in, it will in the, book, in the book of Leviticus, if not before. But it was to carry forth this Adamic peoples and so forth. 13. And it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house that I said unto her, This is thy kindness which thou shalt show unto me. And every place whither we shall come, say of me, he is my brother. Uh, this is what I want to ask of you, Sarah. She must have been quite a beautiful woman. Uh, it's uh, difficult for us in this generation where we have so much pollution and uh, poisons in the air that uh, our bodies age considerably quicker than they did in the beginning when the air was pure and the food was fresh and there were no toxics other than that that is natural in the very ground itself. But at 89 years old to be a looker like this, she had a lot going for her anyway. It, uh, understand what I'm saying. Verse 14. And Abimelech took sheep. I'm sorry, did we skip 13? No, it's 14, okay. Um, and Abimelech took sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants and gave them unto Abraham and restored him Sarah his wife. Now, here again we see a righteous man, that is to say in the sense that he wants to do what's right. Verse 15, And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before thee, Dwell where it pleaseth thee. In other words, you choose whatever spot you want. Now this is really trying to do the man right. Rather than killing him and taking his wife, he said, I'll be neighbors with you. Verse 16. And unto Sarah he said, Behold, I have given thy brother, notice the word brother, not husband, um, okay, I have given thy brother a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, he is to thee a covering of the eyes unto all that are with thee, and with all other, thus she was reproved. In other words, uh, for her part within this, but what he's saying, at the time, and for many years after, and I suppose even to this time, I don't know whether it would be so much in our nation. It seems that people anymore are so um, desensitized that uh, anything can happen among people as far as uh, this person being disgraced or that, and it doesn't seem to make that much difference. But at this time, 
if a woman was taken and returned, it could brand her and she could be looked down upon with shame. And it w not only would it shame her, but it would shame the entire tribe. And what he's saying here, and this is why he wouldn't say your husband, he said brother as though he, his eyes were closed to it. it the saying is this, I have done this making restitution and there is no need in you feeling any shame. I see, I understand, and I'm going to do what is right. So uh, there should be no shame on you or your family. So um, well said, really very well said. And um, I did a poor job perhaps of bringing the Hebrew out in it, but by the customs, you get the drift, okay? Let's go to the next verse, 17. So Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech. Here you understand what had happened, what God had done to the nation. He healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants, and they bear children. So here we see, uh, let me search my mouth. Yes, here we see the first physical healing um, that has taken place through the prayer of a prophet. It would seem that our father, even at this time, early in the, this earth age, uh, as far as his prophets were concerned, you can understand why he would later say, do my prophets no harm. He looks out for them. He really does. He brings blessings on them when they're true prophets, that is to say, teachers of his prophets, teachers of his prophecies. Verse 18, For the Lord had fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. So there you have it. When man fell short, God intervened. Why? Because he had promised the Christ child all the way to the third chapter of this great book of Genesis and about verse 15 and 16 that uh, Christ, in fact, would be the one that would bruise the serpent, Satan, that is to say, the devil's head, kill him, destroy him in the lake of fire. Naturally, the lake of fire is not written of in Genesis 3, but that's the term bruising the head. So he's taking care of that. Satan is a loser. Satan will try and he will feed upon man's weakness. But as long as you have faith in God, as Abraham did, God will protect you. That is something that uh, uh, faith, in a sense, is the fuel that uh, brings to pass success in the Father's eyes. Is to believe upon Him causes, and having faith in Him causes God to intercede even in your life today. Little be known to many people that he does still bring in that inter uh, that he intercedes and uh, takes things away that you're never aware of unless you're very sensitive to discernment. Chapter 21 and verse 1. God, if I were to sum up that entire chapter, excuse me, but if I were to sum up that entire chapter, it would be God protects his own. God especially protects his prophets. 21 verse 1 and it reads, And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. Always keeps his promises. And the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. Verse 2. And for Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the, get this, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. Now it's important that you know God has a set time for everything. Man is not necessarily aware of that. But God has a set time and yes, if you are alert, if you are familiar with your father's words, many times you can pick up on one of those set times. I suppose that we in this generation call them, uh, theologians call them benchmarks in a way. 
those set times come to pass and they always happen exactly as they're written so that's why it's important God promised her though she was barren all those many years God always keeps his word even as God has a set time that this age and this dispensation shall end and a new one shall begin with God nothing ever ends except that that is evil and should not be with us verse 3 and Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him whom Sarah bare to him Isaac Isaac, of course, means laughter. Well, let's see. Yeah, I, I, I'd better explain. Because she laughed when God told her she would conceive. Laughed with joy and little disbelief. Well, not much, I would think. But thus Isaac, uh, being uh, that one, so-called. Verse 4. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. He kept that command. You'll remember Moses was threatened by God with death because he had not circumcised the children that uh, were born to him in his stay in the land of the Kenites, remember? But... Uh, God, uh, Abraham kept his word. Numbers are important. The eighth day, what? Eighth day is new beginnings. It stands, eight means the resurrection, and also it is the number of Christ. Abraham being a hundred, if you would, uh, one hundred is the children of promise or God's um, election of grace. So there's so much in that that you can pass right over that has God's stamp of approval dealt within. Verse 5. And Abraham was a hundred years old. There's that hundred. Uh, the uh, children of promise is what it signifies as well as um, God's um, election of grace. A hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. Verse 6. And Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh so that all that hear will laugh with me. And there you have Isaac. Isaac, which means laughter. And it is a mark of that people that when they are embarrassed or when they are under pressure, they do a very strange thing or even with fear sometimes, they laugh. Verse 7, And she said, Who would have said unto Abraham that Sarah should have given children suck? For I have borne him a son in his old age. Um, and this is her proof that God, in his intercession, because even by this time, and as much as God had shortened to 120 years, or was in that process, that he would have rejuvenated her body, meaning that not only did she conceive, but the body rejuvenated to the point that she could nurse a child. Uh, enough said. <laughs> Verse 8. And the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. It was an important day. Listen to this, verse 9. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had borne unto Abraham, mocking. In other words, um, this boy... Uh, Ishmael would have been, you know, he, was, he wasn't circumcised until he was 13. So time marches on, all right? Verse 10. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son. For the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. 
So this idea was it that Hagar would go into Abraham in the first place? It was Sarah. So we see that these two did not exactly get along. It had been once before that Hagar herself in kind of mocked Sar Sarai before, you know. And uh, now it's, it's the other way around. And what's worse, Sarah simply wants to banish her. Verse 11. And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. In other words, Abraham loved Ishmael. I mean, that's nature, human nature. Uh, this, this son probably at this time was a young man. All right, verse 12. And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman. In all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And of course, this is quoted in Galatians chapter 6, verse 14, 16. And um, also uh, concerning the 430 years versus the 400 years. And really, this looks forward, if you would, to Christ for the seed. Zer, uh, is singular. And it looks forward to the seed that would come forth that would be the savior of the world. And in Isaac shall thy seed be called. This is written also in Romans, the ninth chapter. And you know, it's an interesting thing. When we study languages um, and we trace the migrations, and I know this makes some uncomfortable, don't, don't let it be, it's a fact. It's truth. It happened. And it's very easy historically to document it. Therefore, I do not mind teaching it. We know that the house of Judah and the house of Israel split. We know those ten tribes, being Isaac's sons, became to be called Sach's sons. So you see, the proof is a lot more prevalent than many would have you believe. And some modern linguist would tell you, well, it means a person of, uh, and he would coin a word that wasn't known at this time, British descent. Uh, well, that's just not the case. Sachs' sons, Isaac's sons, that would carry forth that house. And in that would come, um, would uh, the seed be called, okay? Uh, but the point being that when, when the covenant, when the covenant was made, taking from the time that the babe was weaned, um, with the um, birth being 25 years after they entered, that's to say they were 75 when Abraham began his wanderings. He was 100 when the child was born, that's 25 years. And it would be another five years that makes up the 30 years difference of Galatians 3.16. Don't ever think that God's word contradicts itself, all right? Uh, you that have companion Bibles, you're very fortunate. You'll have a, in the parallel column that will be explained in, to, to, uh, in a very clear way. 13. And also the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation because he is thy seed. And thus fulfilling the term in the Hebrew, Abraham, which is to say the father of many nations. This particular lad, uh, Ishmael, would bear also 12 sons as the 12 patriarchs of Israel, the 12 dukes of the Arabian world even today. Verse 14. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it into Hagar, putting it on her shoulder, 
and the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. Uh, I want you to know what Beersheba means. It means the well of the oath, and it's important. Before we finish this chapter, you will understand. You know, do you see something? You know, Abraham is a strange person. He is a very rich man. And he loved that boy, Ishmael. And what did he give her and the boy when he sent him away? God didn't tell him, just give her a bottle of water and bread. This, of course, would be a sheepskin with the legs tied off and the neck whereby it made a drinking uh, bottle, a skin bottle, okay? That's all he gave her. And him a rich man. And you're going to find out that where man falls short, you're going to see God again intercede and take care of the woman and the boy. And in your life today, you had better understand you're going to mess up. Man, mankind, you are going to mess up. But if you have faith in God, He will intercede and He will protect you and He will bring you or allow you success. That's what faith is called. Many would poop all that. Be that as it may, let them. But in your case, never let your faith wane. God knows what he's doing. You don't necessarily know that. Not even God's elect. That's why he intercedes in their life. So here Ole, being uh, a very rich man, gives this poor girl a bottle of water, a loaf of bread, straps the kid on her back, and I'm not, the kid was probably stronger than she was at this time, but suffering that responsibility on her back and sends her out. Verse 15. And the water was spent in the bottle, and she cast the child under one of the shrubs. 16. And she went and set her down over against him a good way off as it were a bow shot that well what would that be uh, a couple of hundred, maybe a hundred yards freak she couldn't hear him in, in his crying and death for she said let me not see the death of the child and she sat over against him and lift up her voice and wept and we'll, we'll pick this up in the next lecture Abraham, a very wealthy man, could have sent, could have even given her servants to see that she could go back to her people. But oh no, loaf of bread, bottle of water, and the responsibility of the child. But you will see in the next lecture, God intercede. And his word, his covenant, through Abraham that this child also, Ishmael, would be the father of nations. We'll see how God intercedes and brings that to pass. Yeah? Now let me tell you, we all fall short. There's certainly nothing new in that. And nobody has the full wrinkle on that. But God, when he makes a promise, and all the promises in his word that are made to you, if you claim them, if you're aware of them, if you depend on him to have them fulfilled, then you really don't, if your faith is strong enough, you don't really have that much to worry about. It will all things work to the good for those that love the Lord with that genuine love. God does not fall short. Man does. So why not choose God and have him on your side? It can sure make a big difference in your life, my friend. You see, you might say, well, how would I know this? Hey, do you know what? He wrote you an entire letter about it. Have you read it? Have you studied it? Have you absorbed it? He loves you enough that he did that. Many should do their part. Some do not. All right, we'll pick this up in the next lecture. Don't miss it. Listen a moment, won't you please?